Shout out to the child brothers and sisters. Uh, we definitely give all praises to Ahaya Ashere Ahaya, the son Yadche Meshiake, and our holy mother, Muaka Kwadoshi. Thank you all for joining us this day. You know, you took out the time in your day to spend it with us and to, to learn and to grow and to prosper in the word of Elohim. And we thank you and we praise him for all the work that he's doing in your lives as well as ours. We just thank Ahaya Ashere Ahaya for all his marvelous work in these days even protecting us from the coronavirus and such as things that are going on in the world, making sure that we're safe. We're going to continue on with the tribe of Naphtali, and we hope that you've been edified on the tribe of Simeon, uh, the tribe of Dan, or Reuben also. But today, we're going to get going on the tribe of Naphtali. The, the ten tribes were predominantly went to the regions of Arsara, which was the islands of the Indian Pacific Ocean, Americas, and Caribbean. They are known as the Aboriginals, or indigenous or natives of those lands and islands. Today, the 10 tribes are scattered across the world presently. So they are not regulated to being in one specific area of the world right now. The 10 tribes consist of Reuben, Simeon, Dan, Naphtali, which we're touching on today, Issachar, Zebulon, Gad, Asher, Ephraim, and Manasseh. In one's personal search for one's tribal origin, one must start by prayer because we have to make our request known with supplication. Then one has to look on our father's lineage to know our tribes according to the scriptures, like Numbers 1 and 2 and Numbers 1 and 22. If one's ancestry stems back to the slaves or the Negroes or the Bantus of Africa or the cargo slave ship, then one is more likely from the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, or Levi and with a slim chance of being Simeon. On the other hand, if one's ancestry stems back to any Native American or indigenous people of the Americas or Caribbean or Aboriginals and indigenous tribes of the Indian Ocean or Pacific Ocean, then you are more likely from 10 tribes of Israel. This series of lessons are to identify the 12 tribes individually according to the spiritual indicators that the patriarch documented that children would face at the last days. We know the signs and curses that help identify the children of Israel around the world today. Yet through the spiritual indicators and the admonitions of the patriarchs, one can identify which specific tribe a person of the house of Israel originates from. It is by the Spirit. Ahia has given the grace to truly identify which tribe of people actually come from, since it is she that brings things to remembrance. She searches for all things and we cannot know anything except the Spirit revealed them. So we have confirmation of that in John chapter 16, verse 13, the Spirit of Truth. Also, you have another reference in John chapter 14, verse 26, and another reference in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. So if you need to see that the Holy Spirit is who reveals things to us, you can look at those chapters and verses. All right, let's get started with the tribe of Naphtali. Jacob testified of the good and bad that would befall the posterity of Naphtali. All right, so we're going to jump over to Genesis chapter 49, verse 21. Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. Jacob had love for Naphtali because Naphtali's goodly words, while he was mourning for Joseph, comforted his heart. Now, there's been many misconceptions of Naphtali giving goodly words, like saying that he said aloha and stuff like that. But through the scriptures, you got understanding of Ahia willing he reveals it today. And also, Naphtali is a high and let loose. So they would be known for the athleticism. They'll be known for the, the gift that Jacob actually told them that they would have. And that was to be like a high and let loose. That would be very athletic. That's another um, indicator of the tribe of Naphtali. To go along with their great athletic ability, the name Naphtali means to wrestle or my wrestling. So it's not uncommon to find the children of Naphtali to be in sports that are very physical, like wrestling or football today. Uh, we're going to jump over to the Testament of Naphtali, chapter 2, verse 1. And I was swift on my feet like the deer, and my father Jacob appointed me for all messages. And as a deer, he give me his blessing. 
So that was the blessing that came from Jacob unto Naphtali. The blessing that he would be very quick, he would be very athletic. So that's another indicator for the tribe of Naphtali. We're going to jump over to the book of Jasher. The, the book of Jasher, chapter 56, verse 59. And Naphtali hearkened to the voice of Joseph, and he hastened and ran down to Egypt. And Naphtali was lighter on foot than any of the stags that were upon the wilderness, for he would go upon ears of corn without crushing them. So he was very, very light-footed. Very, very light-footed, like a deer. Even better than the deer. He was very, very quick. So they will have him deliver the messages because he's very swift, he's very quick, and he's silent. His feet are light. So it wouldn't attract a lot of people. Now we're going to go and we're going to jump over to the appendix of the Testament of Naphtali. Now we also touched on how he gives goodly words. So we're going to go into this book to actually see the good words of Naphtali. Now, the Testament of Naphtali, chapter 10, verse 9. Blessed is the man who does not defile the Holy Spirit of Elohim, which hath been put and breathed into him. And blessed is he who returns it to its creator as pure as it was on the day when he entrusted it to him. Thus far are the words of Naphtali, the son of Israel. All right, so these are the words he was speaking. The rest of that verse goes on to say, With which he admonished his sons with words sweeter than honey. He comforts people with words of righteousness. That was actually the goodly words of Naphtali. He speaks very righteous. People, he comforts their hearts. So that was what in Genesis 49 what it was actually talking about. Naphtali giveth goodly words, because he speaketh words of righteousness and comfort unto the people. He also did that unto Jacob. He was speaking goodly words unto Jacob about Joseph. You also have Deuteronomy 33 and 23. And of Naphtali he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessings of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. So he had favor of Ahia. By the favor of Ahaya, the children of Naphtali are a comely people to look upon as well, even as their father. All right. Now we're actually going to jump into the Testament of Naphtali. We're going to start at chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to go through this so that we can see the spiritual indicators of Naphtali. The spiritual indicators, the good and the bad, so that we can actually identify them. We know one, that he gives the goodly words. He was blessed to be athletic. And being satisfied with favor, he was comely to look upon. There you have some physical characteristics of the children and Naphtali. They're athletic and being satisfied with favor, they're good looking people. So let's continue on and see the different things that are going to go on with the tribe of Naphtali here in the last days. The copy of the Testament of Naphtali, which he ordained at the time of his death in the 132nd year of his life, when his sons were gathered together in the seventh month, on the first day of the month. While still in good health, he made them a feast of food and wine. And after he was awake in the morning, he said to them, I am dying. And they believed him not. And as he glorified Ahia, he grew strong and said that after yesterday's feast, he should die. And he began then to say, Hear my children, you sons of Naphtali. Hear the words of your father. I was born of Bilhah, and because Rachel dealt craftily, and gave Bilhah in place of herself to Jacob, and she conceived and bare me upon Rachel's knees. Therefore she called my name Naphtali. For Rachel loved me very much because I was born upon her lap. And when I was still young, she was wont to kiss me and say, May I have a brother of thine for my own womb, like unto thee. Whence also Joseph was like unto me in all things, according to the prayers of Rachel. So Joseph and Naphtali are very similar. Naphtali was of comely parents like Joseph. But Joseph was very comely. And that helps understand that this lesson is good for the children of Joseph to watch for edification and growth within themselves. Now my mother was Bilhah, 
daughter of Rotheus, the brother of Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, who was born on one and the selfsame day with Rachel. And Rotheus was of the family of Abraham and Chaldean, Alahim fearing, freeborn and noble. He was taken captive and was brought by Laban, and he gave him, Una, his handmaid the wife, and she bore a daughter and called her name Zilpha, after the name of the village in which we had been taken captive. And next she bore Bilhah, saying, My daughter hastens after what is new. For immediately that she was born, she seized the breast and hastened to suck it. And I was swift on my feet like the deer, and my father Jacob appointed me for all messages. And as the deer did he give me his blessing. For as the potter knoweth the vessel, how much it is to contain, and bring its clay accordingly. So also do if I have make the body after the likeness of the spirit, and according to the capacity of the body do if he implant the spirit. And one does not fall short of the other by a third part of a hair, for by weight and measure and rule was all the creation made. And as the potter knoweth the use of each vessel, what it is meet for, so also do if I know of the body, how far it will persist in goodness, and when it beginneth in evil. For there is no inclination or thought which I know of not. For he created every man after his own image, as a man's strength, so also is his work. And as his mind, so also is his skill. And as his purpose, so also is his achievement. And as his heart, so also is his mouth. As his eye, so also is his sleep. As his soul, so also is his word. Either in the law of Ahia or in the works of Elia. So, you can see here that everything was created for its purpose. So, every sense that we have, every body part that we, we have, we have to find use of it to do righteousness. Or else, that body part becomes useful for the enemy. So, Naphtali was given great understanding and wisdom in his writings. And that there is a division between light and darkness, between seeing and hearing, so also is there a division between man and man, and between woman and woman. And it is not to be said that the one is like the other, either in face or in mind. For Allah made all things good in their order. And five senses in the head, and he joined on the neck to the head, adding to it the hair also for comeliness and glory, then the heart for understanding, the belly for excrement, and the stomach for grinding, the windpipe for taking in breath, the liver for wrath, the gall for bitterness, the spleen for laughter, the reins for prudence, the muscles of the loins for power, the lungs for drawing in the loins for strength, and so forth. So then, my children, let all your works be done in order, with good intent in the fear of Allah, and do nothing disorderly and scorn or out of its due season. Now, we're getting into the things that the tribe of Naphtali would struggle with. Naphtali just went into a full exhortation of how the body works, how or how he created man and woman, how he made everyone different how he made some people you know more skillful in the mind some more people more skillful in the body more you know and so on and so forth now the thing is that he said let all your works be done in order so the tribe of Naphtali is going to struggle with disorderliness they weren't going to be doing things in order they were going to be making use of the body not the way that I had commanded it so that was one of the things, and we're going to go into it, I'm going to get further into it, I just don't want to spoil it because it actually goes into it. Um, they're going to be disorderly, and also, they're going to do things without good intent. So they will probably be operating in guile. And do nothing disorderly and scorn or out of its due season. So they will be haughty, they will be prideful because of their ability. So that's a little different than some of the other tribes. They're actually prideful because of maybe their athleticism, 
maybe um, the knowledge or the wisdom that I have given them in the mind. Or maybe due to their comeliness of appearance. Um, they're going to scorn other people. They're going to look down upon people. That was one of the major things for Naphtali, is looking at people in scorn, operating disorderly in scorn, and doing things out of it due season. Where at um, Testament of Naphtali, chapter 2, verse 10, For if thou bid the eye to hear, it cannot. Right? So when you're using your body parts in the wrong way, it doesn't work. Right? It doesn't work for your gain or your profit. So neither while ye are in darkness can you do the works of light. So when you're using your body parts for sin, you can't use them for good also. It doesn't work that way. So this is one of the things of Nathali. A lot of them, they're going to struggle with using their body in the wrong way, if you can understand what I'm saying. Whether it be for uh, prostitution. Or using their body to get attention. Or seduce someone to do something they want them to do. Or just flaunt themselves, glorying in their beauty of appearance. Or whether it be the works of Sodom, as we continue going on. They're going to fall into these things. These are things they're going to struggle with, this specific tribe. Be ye therefore not eager to corrupt your doings through covetousness, or with vain words to beguile your souls. They will operate in guile, right? And they will be covetous. Right, that's the ill intent they'll be dealing in, speaking and doing things out of covetousness to get what they want, instead of letting their actions and their words be out of good intent for the well-being of others. Be ye therefore not eager to corrupt your doings through covetousness, or with vain words to beguile your souls. Because if ye keep silence and purity of heart, ye shall understand how to hold fast the will of Elohim. And cast away the will of Belia. So at the same time, while we are learning the things that are affecting the tribe of Naphtali and really hurting them, the evil spirits that attack them, we're also learning how to implement the things that can help the tribe of Naphtali, right? Now, Naphtali the patriarch said, if ye keep silence and purity of heart, now it's an interesting thing. He said, keep silence and purity of heart. So that means your heart has to be right and you can't be doing anything in ill intent. You have to be doing all things from a pure heart. And that's how the children of Naphtali can overcome operating disorderly. It's because, just like Naphtali said, as a man's strength, so also is his work. As his mind, so also is his skill. So as your mind, if you have a pure heart or a pure mind, your skill, whatever you're doing, is going to come out that way. And as his purpose, so also is his achievement. And that's his heart, so also is his mouth. So if your heart is good, what's going to come out of your mouth is going to be a show of your heart. Now, all these children are corrupted from orderliness with good intent by covetousness. So they have corrupted their orderliness with good intent by covetousness. And instead of goodly words and righteousness, they stumble through vain words that beguile their souls. So they have a problem with hearkening to idols problem with hearkening to evil spirits that lead them astray. Alright, and I'm finishing off, I'm in chapter 3 of the Testament of Naphtali, we're right at the end of verse 2, going into verse 3. Sun and moon and stars change not their order. So do ye also change not the law of Elohim in disorderliness of your doings. So they wouldn't keep the commandments. Through covetousness, it will alter the law of Elohim to get what they desire. Another thing to be noted in the disorder, we know from Corinthians, the order of the household where the man is the head of the woman and Christ is the head of the man. They also struggle with disorderliness in the household from what Naphtali is explaining. The scorn develops in relationships and the men act of order mistreating their wives instead of dwelling with them according to knowledge. Because some bitterness may have sprung up, the men may also use vain words with ill intent to talk the women down instead of comfort them and nurture them in the growth of the faith of Yache. And the women act out of order, usurping authority over their men in scorn and use vain words out of ill intent to bring down their men instead of comfort them like Naphtali would use his words 
you'll find relationships among the children and Naphtali are usually unhealthy due to the disorderliness in scorn and how they speak to one another in the wrong spirit and with the wrong intent. The Gentiles went astray and forsook Ahia and changed their order and obeyed stocks and stones, spirits of deceit. But ye shall not be so, my children, recognizing in the firmament, in the earth, and in the sea, and in all created things, Ahio who made all things, that ye become not as Sodom, which changed the order of nature. Now that was the key indicator that they would change the order the, the tribe of Naphtali would struggle with sodomy. True, brother, and infidelity in relationships because the sodomites didn't keep their marriages undefiled, sleeping with other men's wives. And defiling their daughters. In like manner, the watchers also changed the order of their nature, whom Ahia cursed at the flood, on whose account he made the earth without inhabitants and fruitless. So he just compared the tribe of Naphtali to the watchers that went astray, because they changed the order of their first estate, as it says in Jude. Just like the tribe of Naphtali were going to change the order of their first estate. It is interesting for real that he compared them to the watchers because the watchers erred in that they fell to fornication, being enamored with the beauty of other men's wives in their minds. And that led them astray to change the order of Allah and change their first estate. And then the watchers in turn adorned themselves by changing their figures to appear comely to the women with ill intent to cause the women to lust after them in their minds and bring about fornication and infidelity in the relationships among the sons of men. So you find the children of Naphtali, just as the watchers, they struggle with the spirit of fornication in their mind, leading them to lust after other men's wives, which is disorderly to do. And then also to flaunt themselves for the attention of other men's wives in their mind. You'll find this among the daughters of Naphtali as well, because among the children of Naphtali, both male and female, they have an issue with glorying in their beauty or in their physique, being prideful about it. And that leads them to seek the attention of others by flaunting themselves for the attention it brings. Therefore, the daughters, though having husbands of their own, who struggle with still adorning themselves to deceive the mind of other men, to get that attention that comes from it. Just as the women in the days of the watchers had done through the spirit of fornication. So it's something both men and women of Nafi have to be mindful of to stay in orderliness and with good intent, walking in subjection to the law of Allah men dwelling with their wives according to knowledge and not lusting after another man's wife and doing things in good intent not to gain the attention of another man's wife and then also women doing all things according to the law being in subjection unto their own husbands and not adorning themselves to seek the attention of another person's husband but dwelling seeking how they may please their own husband according to the laws you can confirm these things lead to the infidelity and adultery in relationships because Natalie said his children would be operating like Sodom and in Sodom it was common practice for men to sleep with other men's wives and we can see how the spirit of fornication was working so for edification on overcoming the lust of the eyes and the spirit of fornication you can visit the lesson called lust of the eyes and the lesson identifying the tribe of Reuben as well for edification. Mind you, this is not to say every person of the tribe of Naphtali goes out and commits adultery. The struggle is in the mind, their thoughts. The struggle with fornication happens there and it's something they have to overcome. So they may look upon a person to lust after them, commit adultery in their hearts, not necessarily go act on committing adultery. So through covetousness, the children and after they are struggling with disorderliness as their father mentioned. They were righteous, they were very upright, they had a, a pure heart, they operated with good intent. And they speak goodly words of righteousness to comfort others. And now they're doing everything in evil intent, everything in guile, 
speak in vain words that's not comforting anyone. They're looking down upon people because of their ability. And they're dealing with sodomy. So you can see how they completely done a, a complete turnaround. Just like the Watchers did a complete turnaround because they were doing all things right before they chose to follow after the evil one. Testament of Naphtali, chapter 4, verse 1. These things I say unto you, my children, for I have read in the writing of Enoch that ye yourselves also shall depart from Ahia, walking according to all the lawlessness of the Gentiles, and ye shall do according to all the wickedness of Sodom. So, just as I was saying that Naphtali was completely righteous, they were doing all things orderly and righteous, now they're going to completely do a turn and operate like the Gentiles. So a lot of the things that we went over in the tribe of Dan, they're going to partake in a lot of those things because they're operating as the Gentiles operated, just like the tribe of Dan. And they're also going to fall into sodomy. Now that's different than the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan didn't fall into sodomy according to the Testaments. But this was going to be a major struggle, and this is a major key indicator for the tribe of Naphtali to identify them, to identify if you're from that tribe, if you struggle with that spirit. Naphtali's children will be walking in lawlessness of the nations. They will be very, very worldly-minded. They will be very covetous. They will be operating in guile to get what they want. They will be scorning people, looking down upon people. They will be lifted up through their abilities. Uh, I'm jumping over to Ezekiel, chapter 16, verse 49. Now, we want to touch on Sodom because this is one of their major things. And sodomy wasn't just homosexuality that was their issue. So, so that we can get a further understanding of what's going on with the tribe of Naphtali. Behold, this is the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride. Pride was one that you see how they're scorning. They look at people to scorn because they're lifted up in pride. They're haughty. So they look down upon people. So pride is one. Fullness of bread, that means they have more than enough. They're covetous. So you can see exactly why Ahia is actually saying that they were doing the abominations of Sodom because they're literally operating like Sodom operated. So pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. The abundance of idleness. So you have too much time to do iniquity. They're not doing works of righteousness. They're not pushing themselves forward. They're idle. And you know what an idle mind does. An idle mind leads you to iniquity. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So through their covetousness, they're not going to be they're very willing to give. They're going to be more, it's about me. I have to get what I need to get. Right. That's really interesting because you see the opposite in Tobit, where he was into alms giving and helping the poor, good people. So he really was an example of a good man of Naphtali. I'm going to continue in verse 50 of Ezekiel 16. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. So that's the homosexuality. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. All right, so I just want to touch on the iniquity of Sodom so that you can understand the fullness of what Ahia was saying with them having the problem with sodomy. It wasn't only homosexuality, it was pride, the abundance of bread, idleness, Along with the homosexuality, there was more to it than just that. So it gives you further understanding of what's going to be going on with the tribe of Naphtali. So we can see, as you mentioned, Zakwa, due to their physical abilities, knowledge, or favor and beauty, the children of Naphtali are prideful, being haughty, looking down upon others in scorn, like Sodom. There was something to take note of as well pertaining to them being like Sodom to understand what Naphtali was saying about how they corrupt their doings through covetousness and vain words. In Joshua chapter 18, a traveler from Elam had a fine mantle, and a man of Sodom coveted it, so he played nice with the traveler, bringing him into his home, treating him well, with ill intent, 
because he really just wanted that mantle. And he was talking them up, playing his friend in guile to find an opportunity to get his mantle and eventually did so. So you'll find the children of Naphtali through covetousness will be guileful. In ill intent, they'll want something from you or need you for something. And they'll befriend you or treat you good. But the intent is ill, having an ulterior motive. And they'll talk those vain words in guile to deceive you to do or give them what they want for their gain, not for your comfort. They'll beguile their souls because they think they're clever in what they're doing. In layman's terms, you'll find the children of Naphtali struggle with trying to run game on folks to get what they want, especially with their words speaking vainly. Also, Naphtali desired his children to be silent in purity of heart and to do things in due season. So with the struggle with pride, haughtiness, and vain words, you'll find the children of Naphtali today to be talkative, or chatty, usually dominating conversations or speaking out of due season. It's a type of thing where a person talks majority of the time to where no one else gets to speak. Or they are one-uppers, wherein anything someone says they have to say something to align with it or go beyond it, or to bring the conversation back to being about themselves. Or they'll just talk to be talking, and they'll also talk out of season not discerning the time, speaking of their own will, not being silent in a pure heart to wait on the will of Allah Hayyim to speak. So Naphtali the Patriarch spoke in due season goodly words of righteousness to comfort others, whereas his children today are talkative, speaking as they please, empty words for their own profit being into themselves. You may say they are the types of people that like to hear themselves talk because of the issue with pride. Thankfully, the cure is simple. To practice being silent and purifying the heart to be sure the purpose of speaking is with good intent for others, not just thinking about oneself. Now I'm jumping back over to the Testament of Naphtali, chapter 4, where verse 10. And the highest shall bring captivity upon you, and there shall ye serve your enemies. And ye shall be bowed down with every affliction and tribulation, until the higher have consumed you all. And after ye have become managed and made few, ye shall return and acknowledge Ahaya Ya Allahayim. So they were going to get completely torn down. And there were only going to be a remnant left of the tribe of Naphtali. And he shall bring you back into your land according to his abundant mercy. And it shall be that after that they come into the land of their fathers, they shall again forget Ahaya and become unholy. And Ahaya shall scatter them upon the face of all the earth until the compassion of a higher shall come so this is just things that happen in history and the things that are going to happen at the end here right that shows the children and after they are also scattered across the earth in the end times until the compassion of a higher shall come which is speaking of Yahweh christ so they won't be gathered until here in the end times too a man work in righteousness and work in mercy unto all them that are far off and to them that are near. So he just pretty much had the prophecy that they were going to get taken away out of their land. They were going to come back into their land. Right. That shows that Naphtali was among that remnant of the ten tribes dwelling in the cities of Jerusalem among the inhabitants of Judah who returned after the Babylonian captivity. Then they were going to work on righteousness and they were going to get cast out and get scattered, you know, and that's exactly what happened. That's true, brother. They are sitting scattered in the earth today and they are actually waiting on the compassion of the Lord to come. So Naphtali had visions which he told his children for them to understand what shall come to pass in these last times. Uh, the Testament of Naphtali, I'm jumping to chapter 8, verse 1. And lo, my children. I have shown unto you the last times how everything shall come to pass in Israel. Do ye also therefore charge your children that they be united to Levi and Judah? Now that was the key for the tribe of Naphtali to be united with Levi and Judah because the, the testimony was going to come through Levi and Judah. And that's how their tribe would be saved, that they would be able to come back to Ahayel 
right? He just explained to them that they're going to be scattered waiting on the compassion of the Lord to come. And he's showing them that it's through Levi and Judah that compassion is going to arise for the salvation of all the world when they be given power to preach the gospel. For through them shall salvation arise unto Israel, and in them shall Jacob be blessed. For through their tribes shall Elohim appear dwelling among men on earth to save the race of Israel, and to gather together the righteous from amongst the Gentiles. <laughs> That's exactly what the preaching of the gospel is going to do, is go bring all the children of Abraham through faith and by faith unto Yahweh Christ. For in the fortieth year of my life, I saw a vision on the Mount of Olives, on the east of Jerusalem, that the sun and the moon were standing still, and behold, Isaac, the father of my father, said unto us, Run and lay hold of them, each one according to his strength. And to him that seizeth them will the sun and the moon belong. And we all of us ran together, and Levi lay hold of the sun, and Judah outstripped the others and seized the moon. And they were both of them lifted up with them. And when Levi became as a son, lo, a certain young man gave to him twelve branches of palms. So you can see that Levi was going to be the priest over the nation of Israel. That's why he got the twelve branches of palms symbolizing the twelve tribes. That's right, brother, because the book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, it said that the law of truth was in his mouth, and that iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of Ahab of hosts. So, by what Naphtali saw, Levi would have to be there for the people to be turned away from their iniquity by hearing the law of truth, and that they would be able to inquire of the law at his mouth to turn unto righteousness through the preaching of the gospel, even as Peter of the tribe of Levi preached unto the people. And Judah was bright as the moon, and under their feet were twelve rays. Genesis 49 tells of how Judah is a lawgiver, so he would also be a teacher, as David was a preacher, and also you see James in the New Testament preaching alongside Peter. But interestingly, even as Yache, Dan talked about how he taught people by his walk. So you have Levi as a teacher, but then you have Judah setting the example of a believer, even as Yache did. And through these two, because of the vision of Naphtali, he said that 12 rays was under their feet. So it takes the both of them setting the example and preaching the gospel for the light to shine unto the 12 tribes and cause them to awake and be lights unto the world here in these end times. Judah was the kingly tribe. So it was symbolizing his order. 12 rays were under their feet, symbolizing that they're going to be over the 12 tribes. And the two Levi and Judah ran and laid hold of them, and a bull upon the earth with two great horns, and an eagle's wings upon his back. And we wished to seize him, but could not. But Joseph came and seized him, and ascended up with him on high. So this is symbolic about what happened in the Exodus. You had Moses, who was symbolic of the tribe of Judah. You had Aaron, who was symbolic of the tribe of Levi. And then you had Ephraim. Right, Joshua was there. Who was symbolic of the tribe of Joseph. And you know that Judah and Levi, they were together. And after that arose Ephraim to deliver the children of Israel into the land. So you can see the same order happening here, where Judah and Levi weren't able to seize the bull, but they had already got the sun and the moon. And then after they had gotten the sun and the moon, here came the bull with the two horns, and Joseph was able to seize it, and he, and he ascended. Right, just like we discussed in the end, shall be like the Exodus. Judah and Levi are going to preach the gospel, and the twelve tribes are going to awaken and become lights to the world. And then Yahweh is going to be with the son of Joseph, just as Yahweh was with Joshua in the ancient time. And he's going to deliver the people and bring them to the land. This is what Naphtali was seeing in his vision. But Joseph came and seized him 
and ascended up with him on high. And I saw, for I was there, and behold, an holy writing appeared to us, saying, Assyrians, Medes, Persians, Chaldeans, Syrians, shall possess in captivity the twelve tribes of Israel. And again, after seven days, so this is another vision that Naphtali's having, just so everybody can understand, all right? And again, after seven days, I saw our father Jacob standing by the sea of Jamnia, and we were with him. And behold, there came a ship sailing by without sailors or pilot. And there was written upon the ship, the ship of Jacob. And our father said to us, Come, let us embark on our ship. And when he had gone on board, he, there rose a vehement storm and a mighty tempest of wind. And our father, who was holding the helm, departed from us. And we being tossed with the mighty waves until it was broken up. And Joseph fled away upon the little boat. And we were all divided upon nine planks. And Levi and Judah were together. And we were all scattered unto the ends of the earth. Then Levi, girt about with sackcloth, prayed for us all unto Ahiah. And when the storm ceased, the ship reached the land as it were in peace. And our father came, and we all rejoiced in one accord. So that vision was showing how the twelve tribes would be scattered. How Jacob, he left because this was going to happen to his children. It wasn't going to happen to Jacob. So he left and got on a different boat. The other children, they were scattered upon planks, upon nine planks. And Joseph fled away on the little boat. So <laughs> you could see the dichotomy. Right. You had Judah and Levi for the southern kingdom, and Joseph went off on his own boat for the ten tribes. And it took Levi to gird himself with sackcloth to actually pray for us, for a higher to have mercy upon us. So you can see that it's going to be very, very key that Levi gets back right and gets back the understanding of Allah Hayim so that they can actually pray for the tribe but in the nation of Israel so that the Hayim may have mercy upon us. So everybody has a very, very key, everybody has a very, very uh, strong purpose and, and everybody has their part to play in this. But at the end, we all rejoice in one accord, so pray the Hayim for that. So, I am willing we get to see that. To the Testament of Naphtali, we're at chapter 7, verse 1. These two dreams I told my father, and he said to me, These things must be fulfilled in their season. After that, Israel hath endured many things. Then my father saith unto me, I believe, Allah, I am that Joseph liveth. For I see always that a higher number of him with you. And he said, weeping, Ah me, my son Joseph, thou livest, though I behold thee not. And thou seest not Jacob that begot thee. He causeth me also therefore to weep by these words. And I burned in my heart to declare that Joseph had been sold, but I feared my brethren. And lo, my children, I have shown unto you the last time how everything shall come to pass in Israel. Do ye also therefore charge your children that they be united to Levi and to Judah. For through them shall salvation arise unto Israel, and in them shall Jacob be blessed. For through their tribes shall Allah appear dwelling among men on earth. To save the race of Israel, and to gather together the righteous from amongst the Gentiles. If ye work that which is good, my children, then both men and angels shall bless you, and Allah shall be glorified among the Gentiles through you. That shall come by the preaching of the two witnesses to cause all the tribes to awaken in, in those twelve rays of light that Naphtali saw to be a light unto the Gentiles to glorify Allah And the devil shall flee from you, and the wild beasts shall fear you, and the higher shall love you, and the angels shall cleave to you, as a man who has trained a child well is kept in kindly remembrance, so also for a good work there is a good remembrance before Allah Hayyam. And let us remember that our works are seen. Allah Hayyam seeth for everything. 
So let us continue to do good works so that we may be feared by beasts. Allah may look upon us and remember us. The angels may be on our side so that nothing can overtake us. It starts with us doing good works and doing what's right and stopping sinning and striving and striving for perfection in the law and in the fruits of the Spirit. Having that faith, having that belief that we can do it, that we can do all things through Yahche, through Allah. But him that doeth not that which is good, both angels and men shall curse, and Allah shall be dishonored among the Gentiles through him, and the devil shall make him his own peculiar instrument. And every wild beast shall master him, and the highest shall hate him. All right, so if we're doing bad works to whom we serve, it's to whom we worship. So if we're doing works of iniquity, then Satan has, has control over us. We have to make a choice. For the commandments of the law are twofold, and through prudence must they be fulfilled. For there is a season for a man to embrace his wife, and a season to abstain there from her for his prayer. Right? So there's a season for all things. There's a season to embrace your wife. There's a season to pray when things are going on. It's a season where you need to separate yourself for a time and to pray. So then, there are two commandments. Unless they be done in due order, they bring very great sin upon men. So also is it with the other commandments. But ye therefore, wise and Elohim, my children, and prudent, understand the order of his commandments, and the law of every word that Ahiah may love you. Right. So Naphtali's children struggle with rashness, recklessness, and folly. They must overcome it through prudence, which leads them to be cautious, circumspect, wise, and have good judgment and discretion. Right. So we're learning a lot about our brothers and sisters here. All right. Chapter 9 of the Testament of Naphtali. And when he had charged them with many such words, he exhorted them that they should remove his bones to Hebron, and that they should bury him with his fathers. And when he had eaten and drunken with a merry heart, he covered his face and died. And his sons did according to all that Naphtali the father had commanded them. Alright, so we're jumping into the appendix of the Testament of Naphtali. We're starting at chapter 1, verse 1. The Testament of Naphtali, Naphtali the son of Jacob, whom Bilhah, the handmaid of Rachel, had borne him. Right? And his name, the wrestling of Allah. When Naphtali had grown old, and had come to a good old age and had completed his years of strength and fulfilled the duty of the earth-born man he began to command his children and he said unto them my children come and draw near and receive the commands of your father and they answered and said unto him lo we hearken to fulfill all thou commandest us and he said unto them i do not command you concerning my silver nor concerning my gold nor all my substance that I leave unto you here under the sun, nor do I command you any difficult thing which you may not be able to accomplish. But I speak to you about an easy matter which you can fulfill. So Naphtali, Naphtali in righteousness, he wasn't worried about gold and silver, he wasn't worried about substance. So you can see how opposite his children would be in the last days operating through covetousness. Because Naphtali, he didn't command them anything concerning the gold, silver, the substance, the flocks, none of that. He was like, I'll let y'all work that out. I don't have a problem. But this is what I'm going to command you. I'm not going to command you something hard. It's very easy that I'm going to command you. And his son answered and replied a second time and said, Speak, O Father, for we listen. And he said unto them, I give you no command, save in regard to the fear of Adonia. Him shall you serve, and him shall you cleave. So the only command he gave to his children is, because he was very simplistic, was to serve Adonia and to cleave unto him. And they said unto him, What need hath he of our service? And he said unto them, 
it is not he have need of any creature, but it is all creatures of the world have need of him. But he have not created the world for naught, but that his creatures should fear him, and that none should do to his brother what he doeth not like for himself. So love thy brother as thyself. That was another commandment. They said to him, Our father, have thou forsooth seen us depart from thy ways, or from the ways of our fathers, either to the right or to the left? And he said to them, The Adonai and I are witnesses, that it is even as ye say. But I dread that which is to come. We shall go astray after the Alahims and strange nations, and walk according to the ordinance of the people of the lands. So the children of Naphtali would go into idolatry. So they would steer away from the Adonai of Israel and, and cleave unto the idols of the Gentiles and do after the ways of the Gentiles. And least ye join the children of Joseph instead of the children of Levi and the children of Judah. Right, because Joseph was the king over the northern kingdom, which caused all the ten tribes to sin. So it was a foretelling of that the children of Naphtali would cleave unto Joseph instead of cleaving unto Levi and Judah like they were commanded to. And they said unto him, What doest thou see that thou commandest us in this wise? And he said unto them, because I know that one day the children of Joseph would depart from the Adonai, the Elohim of their fathers, and cause the children of Israel to sin, and to become banished from the good land into another that is not ours, as we have been exiled through his being a bondservant in Egypt. Now, I thought it was shown future prophecy that would become upon the northern kingdom of Israel, how Joseph, their king, would cause the children of Israel to depart from Elohim the true Elohim or worship idols and how they would be kicked out of their land which happened and they were, they were taken into captivity into the land of Assyria and after the land of Assyria they fleed off to Arzur that's when they get spread out through the four corners of the earth further I would tell you the vision I saw when I was pasturing the flock I saw and lo my twelve brothers were pasturing with me in the field and lo, and our father came and said to us, My children, run and seize ye each before me. What comes to his portion? We answered and said unto him, What shall we seize? Lo, we see nothing but the sun, moon, and the stars. And he said unto them, Take hold of them. When Levi heard it, he seized a staff in his hand and jumped upon the sun and sat and rode thereon. And when Judah saw it, he did likewise. And he seized a staff and sprang upon the moon and rode thereon. So did all the tribes, each rode upon his star and his planet in the heavens. And Joseph only remained alone upon the earth. Jacob our father said unto him, My son, why hast thou not done as thy brothers? He said unto him, My father, what have they that are born of woman to do in the heavens? And as in the earth, they must need stand upon the earth. And while Joseph was speaking, lo, there stood near him a huge bull with great wings like the wings of a stork, and his horns huge like the horns of the ring. And Jacob said to him, Get up, my son Joseph, and ride upon him. And Joseph got up and mounted upon the bull. And Jacob our father departed from us. For about four hours Joseph gloried in the bull. At times he walked and ran, and times he flew up with him, till he came near to Judah. And Joseph stretched out the standard he had in his hand and began to smite Judah his brother. Judah said to him, My brother, why doest thou smite me? And he said to him, Because thou holdest in thy hands twelve staffs and I have only one. Give me ten, and there shall be peace. But Judah refused to give them to him, and Joseph then said to his ten brothers, Wherefore, run ye after Judah and Levi, depart from them, and follow after me. So you can see the, the vision 
that Naphtali was seeing is how everybody was under Judah. So Judah and Joseph were fighting each other and Joseph wanted the 10 tribes under him. So you can see exactly how it, it happened with the Northern and Southern Kingdom, how Joseph, the tribe of Ephraim actually caused the Northern Kingdom to go astray from Adono and to not keep the commandment of their father to follow after Levi and Judah. When his brothers heard Joseph's words, they departed from Levi and Judah as one man to follow Joseph. And there remained with Judah only Benjamin and Levi. So you can see how the vision is foretelling the split between the northern and southern kingdom of Israel. And when Levi beheld this, he descended from the sun, full of troubled spirit. Joseph said to Benjamin his brother, Benjamin my brother, art thou not my brother? Come thou also with me. But Benjamin refused to go with Joseph his brother. And it came to pass, when the day drew to an end, lo, there arose a mighty storm, which separated Joseph from his brothers, and that no two were left together. And when I beheld this vision, I related it to Jacob my father, and he said unto me, So you can see that storm that came with Elohim that caused all of them to be scattered, and that's why no two were left together which fulfilled the prophecy. When I beheld this vision, I related it to Jacob, my father, and he said unto me, My son, it is only a dream, which while neither ascend nor descend, for it hath not been repeated. And Jacob didn't understand the vision. So you can see how it's not always given to man. Even the righteous, Ahaya works in mysterious ways, and sometimes it's not given to every man to understand. We're in verse 4 of the appendix of Naphtali now. But no long time elapsed when I saw another vision. While we stood all together with Jacob our father on the shore of the great sea, behold a ship came sailing in the middle of the sea without a sailor and a man. And our father said to us, Do you see what I'm seeing? We see it. He said unto us, Do what you see me doing. Thereupon Jacob our father took off his clothes and threw himself into the sea, and we all followed him. And the first were Levi and Judah, and they jumped into a ship, and Jacob was them. And behold, in that ship there was all the goodness of the world. Jacob our father said unto them, Look at what is written on the mast, for there is no ship on which the name of the master is not written on the mast. Then Levi and Judah looked and saw, and behold there was written, this ship belongs to the son of Berechel, and all the good therein. When Jacob our father heard that, he rejoiced very much, and bowed down, and thanked Elohim. He said, Not enough that he has blessed me on earth, he has blessed me on the sea too. And he said unto us, My children, quit yourself like men, and whatever each one of you seizes, that shall be his share. Thereupon Levi sprang to the big mast therein and set upon it. The second after him, Judah, also leapt into the second mast, which was next to Levi's mast. And he also sat thereon. And the rest of my other brothers took each his oar. And Jacob our father grasped the two rudders to steer the ship by them. And Joseph was left alone. And our father said unto him, My son Joseph, take thou also thine oar. But Joseph refused. When my father saw that Joseph refused to take his oar, he said unto him, Come, come here, my son, and take one of the rudders which I hold in my hands, and steer the ship while let thy brother row with the oars until you reach land. And he taught each one of us, and said unto us, Thus ye shall steer the ship, and ye will not be afraid of the waves of the sea, nor of the stormy winds when they shall arise against you. And when he had made an end of commanding us, he disappeared from us. And Joseph took both the rudders, one with the right hand and one with the left. And the rest of my brothers were rowing, and the ship sailed on and floated over the waters. 
And Levi and Judah set upon the two masts to look out which way the ship was to take. As long as Joseph and Judah were of one mind, and Judah showed Joseph which was the right way. Joseph directed thither the ship, and the ship sailed on peaceably without hindrance. So as long as Judah and Joseph were in the same mind, everything was well. So you can see the following of the vision. So you've seen Judah and Joseph fighting and how everybody split. Now in this vision, Judah and Joseph are actually working together and everything is peaceable. And after a while, a quarrel arose between Joseph and Judah. All right, so here we go. So everything was peaceable without hindrance when Ju Joseph and Judah were operating on the same mind in the same accord. And after a while, a quarrel arose between Joseph and Judah. And Joseph no longer steered the ship according to the words of his father and the teachings of Judah. And the ship went a wrong course. And the waves of the sea dashed it on a rock so that the ship was broken up. Now, as you see the, the pride of Joseph, you can not only exactly seeing the pride of Joseph and seeing how Joseph, when he didn't, when he didn't keep the commandment of his father Jacob, and he didn't listen to the good words of Judah, he went astray. And that's exactly what happened with the, the northern and southern kingdom. You know, Joseph's children were lifted up, and it caused the split between the northern and southern kingdom after the reign of, of Solomon. Then Levi and Judah descended from the mass to escape for their lives. So, of course, the tribe of Judah, tribe of Joseph, got to get along. Got to humble yourself and work together and be on one mind and one accord. That's the only way everything's going to be peaceable and that prophecy is going to be fulfilled. So that's an admonishment for those two tribes. This is true because the scripture in Psalms 78 said in Judah, Allah I am known. And we've seen how wisdom is given to Judah, the wisdom given unto David and the wisdom given unto Solomon to lead the tribes aright. And even in the vision, Judah led the people aright by Allah and guiding the ship. Of course, Levi was there with his portion as a teacher to make sure everything was going right in helping with the leadership of the tribes. From what the vision showed, it, Joseph's children Joseph envied the leadership role that Judah had being over the tribes and that inspired him to envy Judah and that's essential for Joseph's children to pay attention to because in one of the prophecies it tells how Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim because Ephraim gets vexed at seeing the prosperity Allah is doing in Judah and envies them just as was the case in Naphtali's vision. But this call and seeing the vision of Naphtali shows that Joseph has to be orderly in his role of being the firstborn and setting an example of a believer following the instructions of Judah as we've seen how the ship went prosperously as Judah was instructing Joseph and Joseph was receiving instruction. So it's definite that these two tribes, Ephraim, and Judah need to work together in humility of heart with one another. Then Levi and Judah descended from the mass to escape for their lives. And as for the rest of the brothers, we escaped for our lives to the shore. And behold, there came Jacob our father and found us dispersed. One here and another there. So you can see the dispersing of the twelve tribes. Everybody was scattered. He said unto us, What is the matter with you, my sons? Perhaps you have not steered the ship as I ought. So he said, You didn't steer the ship like I commanded you. You didn't do what I commanded you to. Y'all all didn't work together. Y'all all didn't be of one accord, one mind, operating in, in unity. Like, you all went your own directions and were lifted up. So this is what our Father's going to say to us when that day comes. Why didn't y'all keep my commandment? Why didn't y'all operate in peace and love toward one another? Why were y'all not all in one accord, keeping my commandments, operating in the fruits of the Spirit? What happened? You know? 
And we said unto him, By the life of thy servants, we have not departed from anything that thou hast commanded us. But Joseph transgressed against the command, for he did not steer the ship according to thy command. And as he was instructed by Levi and Judah, for he was jealous of them. Children of Joseph have to be mindful not to be jealous of Judah or Levi for things to work and our deliverance to come because as Naphtali saw, it's going to be Judah, Levi, and a man of the house of Joseph just as it was Moses, Aaron, and Joshua working together to deliver the tribes in the ancient times. So this is a great exhortation for us understanding what's needed for what's to come. And he said unto us, Show me the place of the ship. And he saw, and behold, the tops of the mast were visible. And behold, it was floating upon the surface of the water. And my father whistled, and we all gathered round him. And he cast himself into the sea, as before, and he repaired the ship. And he reproved Joseph, and said unto him, My son, thou shalt not again deceive, nor be jealous of thy brothers, for they were nearly lost through thee. So you can see exactly what was going to happen the northern kingdom how they were going to be lost through the tribe of joseph and how joseph has to humble himself for the sake of all the tribes i'm in chapter 7 the appendix to Naphtali. and when i recounted the vision to my father he smote his hands together and sighed and his eyes shed tears and i waited till i was ashamed and he spake no words to me. So I took the hand of my father to embrace it and to kiss it. And I said to him, O servant of Adonai, why do thy eyes shed tears? He said unto me, My son, because of the repetition of thy vision, my heart has sunk within me, and my body is confounded by reason of Joseph, my son. For I love him above you all, and for the wickedness of my son Joseph, you will be sent into captivity, and you will be scattered among the nations. For thy first and second vision are both one and the same vision. Therefore I command you not to unite with the sons of Joseph, but only with Levi and Judah. Furthermore, I tell you, my lot shall be in the best of the middle of the earth. This helps understand what Naphtali blessing was referring to in Deuteronomy 33. In 23, when it said, Satisfied with favor and full with the blessing of Ahiah, possess thou the west and the south. His land is the best of the land within the allotment of the children of Israel. And we know the blessing he received was from Jacob being blessed as a deer. So it helps understand Naphtali better through his testimonies. And ye shall eat and be satisfied with its delights. I warn you not to kick in your fatness, and not to rebel, and not to oppose the commandment of Adonai, who satisfies you with the good things of his earth. And do not forget Adonai, your Elohim, the Elohim of your fathers, who was chosen by our father Abraham when the nations were divided in the time of Peleg. For at that time, Adonai, blessed be he, came down from his highest heaven to brought down with him seventy ministering angels, Michael at their head. And he commanded them to teach the seventy families, which sprang from the loins of Noah, seventy languages, for which the angels descended and did according to the command of their Creator. But the holy language, the Hebrew language, remained only in the house of Shem and Eber, and in the house of Abraham our father, who was one of their descendants. And on that day Michael took a message from Adonai, and said to the seventy nations, to each nation separately, you know the rebellion you undertook and the treacherous confederacy into which you entered against the Adono of heaven and earth. And now choose today whom you will worship and who shall be your intercessor in the height of heaven. Nimrod the wicked answered and said, For me there is none greater than he who taught me and my people in one hour the language of Cush. And in like manner also answered Put and Mizraim and Tubal, and Javan, and Meshech, and Tyrus. And every nation chose its own angel, and none of them mentioned the name of Adonai, blessed be he. 
But when Michael said to Abraham, my father, Abram, whom do thou choose? And whom wilt thou worship? Abraham answered, I choose and select only him who said, and the world was created, who formed me in the womb of my mother, body within body, who placed in me spirit and soul. Him I choose, and him will I cleave. I am my seed all the days of the world. Then the Most High dispersed the nations and appointed and allotted to every nation its share and lot. And from that time, all the nations of the earth separated themselves from Adonai, blessed be he. Only the house of Abraham remained with his creator to worship him, and after him Isaac and Jacob. Therefore, my sons, I conjure you not to go astray and worship any other Elohim than him whom your fathers have chosen. So we know that the tribe of Naphtali is going to go into idolatry and that we're going to stray away from Elohim. Right. That's why it's not uncommon to find among the children of Naphtali the worship of creation and worshiping the sun, moon, trees, water, and things of that nature, just like the Gentiles did. As in the book Gad the Seer, when David had to teach Hiram the Gentile how Elohim is the creator of all the things. To help understand that he's who to be worshipped because the Gentiles have a thing for worshipping creation. For know assuredly that there is none like unto him, and no other who can do as he or like his works in heaven and on earth, and there is none who can do wonders like unto his mighty deeds. A portion only of his power you can see in the creation of man. How many notable wonders are there not in him? He created him from head to foot. With his ears he hears, and with his eyes he sees. And with his brain he understands, and with his nose he smells. And with his windpipe he brings forth his voice. And with his gullet he absorbs food and drink. And with his tongue he speaks, and with his mouth he completes. And with his hands he does his work. And with his heart he reckons, and with his spleen he laughs, and with his liver he is angry, and with his maw he grinds, and with his feet he walks, and his lungs are for breathing, and by his reins he is counseled. And none of his members changes its function, but every one keeps to his own. It is therefore proper for man to lay to heart all these things, who have created him, and who it is that hath wrought him out of an ill-smelling drop in the womb of the woman? And who it is that bringeth him out into the light of the world? And who hath given him the sight of eyes and the walking of the feet? And who causeth him to stand upright and bringeth him nigh to his creator and to his place? And hath prepared good deeds in the place of insight? And hath poured into him a living soul and a pure spirit from himself. Lest is the man who does not defile the Holy Spirit of Elohim, which hath been put and breathed into him. And blessed is he who returns it to his creator, as pure as it was on the day when he entrusted it to him. Thus far are the words of Naphtali, the son of Israel, in which he admonished his sons with words sweeter than honey. All right, so we definitely see that Naphtali gives us good words. He's very athletic, All right? And we also see the problems that go on with Naphtali, the pride, the haughtiness, the, the sodomy. Not only the acts of sodomy, like same kind of relations, but also they'll have the relationships of Sodom when there's infidelity in marriages and the disorderliness within the marriages wherein the women are serving themselves over the men and the men are dwelling with their wives according to knowledge the idleness the, the covetousness the misuse of the tongue and the body to do things with wrong intent or to speak things that are not for the comfort or helping of others but for their own gain through the covetousness you will be operating like the gentiles you know, all these things that the children of Naphtali struggle with. But we also see the great things in Naphtali. When they're in righteousness, they're very, very righteous. 
They're not covetous. They don't care anything about gain or wealth. True. Tobit was an example of that. They're, they're very, very even killed. They're very, very temperate. And they're very, very loving. So we definitely pray for the tribe of Naphtali. And uh, if, if any of these things fit you, after we went over this lesson and we went over a lot of information, if any of these things fit you, um, you know, definitely pray and ask Ahaya to reveal it and the Holy Spirit to reveal it unto you to see if you're actually from this tribe so that these things can actually help you. The things that we went over of how to overcome for the tribe of Naphtali, let these things be mindful unto you so you can understand and overcome the curses that are in the evil spirits that attack this tribe. It's definitely something to pray about because Naphtali and Joseph are very much alike. So a person who identifies with these things could be from either tribe. And these things are edifying for both tribes. So may I have help indeed. And with that, Shabbat to Chalam, the um, brother Tanedu. Shabbat to Chalam, brother Hanu. Shabbat to Chalam, brother Johnny. Shabbat to Chalam, Peak Feather, the Gape. I really hope you all enjoyed the lesson. If there's any other questions or any other things that weren't answered, please, you can write them here on the chat if we have time, or you can send us an email at hebrewreaders at gmail.com. We'll be glad to answer your questions. If anybody is from the tribe of Naphtali, <laughs> pray be to Ahaya Lahayam. We uh, definitely like to see when people uh, figure out what tribe they're from from the nation of Israel, because it's a, it's a great understanding to have to overcome the evil spirits that work against you. And when we say that, we mean if, if you think you're from another tribe and you're reading the testimonies of the 12 patriarchs and you're trying to find out how to overcome these spirits that are attacking you, it doesn't work for you if you're from another tribe. So you have to know what tribe you're from and able to overcome and able to actually know your portion in prophecy. So it, it's very, very comforting. Uh, Shabbat to Chalam, Brother Niger. All right, so everybody enjoy your Shabbat today. We praise you and we glorify Ahaya Alahayam. And if you have any other questions, please just send us an email. All right, Shabbat to Chalam.